Wow. And these are all scenes that come from the rim pack, um, the rim of the, the Pacific. These are oh. the ships uh, that were a part of the exercise in 2016. Uh, oh. For 200 ships and aircraft were oh. part of it, and submarines. <sighs> wow. A huge armada uh, that practices in the waters off Hawaii. And one of the things that they do is practice bombing ships. So they bring ships out of mothballs in from Pearl Harbor and Honolulu and bomb at least one of them to the ocean floor every year, which is a great environmental hazard. They also, here's another shot of them bombing this um, ship. And lots of ordnance that's used, uh, very dangerous and nasty stuff. And of course, the waters of Hawaii have all sorts of marine life in them that can certainly be harmed. And if, if the eardrums of the mammals, of dolphins, and whales. But it's a very brutal uh, exercise as, as war is and practicing for war and they practice using lots and lots of munitions. And if you look closely, you'll see the flags of many, many different countries that participate. 26 countries participated in the last, uh, the last exercise or war maneuvers, war practice. They use torpedoes, they use bombs, they use artillery shells. All of this now littering the floor of the Pacific. And these are a very large and sophisticated, and terrible war machines. That are capable of shooting not only in the ocean but also from the ocean onto land as they've done in Syria and other places. The Israeli Navy sending artillery shells from ships into Gaza with great frequency. It's a very strong, strong, explosive time. And you can see the lineup. This is their parade of ships, of warships, as you can see, that they do for the publicity, the pictures that they want to show to their governments to show how important it is that their country participate in these exercises, these war maneuvers. Will I stop now? Uh, let's go one, just a little bit more, and then it shows some marine mammals that we'd like to see. Okay. Uh, we don't like to see them, but it's an important part of this that they should. And just to see the, you know, the, these, uh, there's a lot of very, very expensive munitions that are used in this war practice and monies that could, should be used for many, many other things. We should be coming up just in a moment to the, well, and here's some of the underwater explosives like the torpedoes or uh, uh, bombs. So yes, that's, that's good, thank you. Well, then here, here we have some of the marine mammals that will be injured if not killed uh, by, uh, by these war maneuvers. And we know that the sonar uh, of these ships uh, will kill these animals. That's, that's good right there, Jody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we say um, welcome uh, to Stop Rimpac Seminar. 
The video you've just seen gives you an idea of the scale of the largest naval war games in the world, which are called Rim of the Pacific, or RIMPAC for short. We thank Oren Susumi of Honolulu for the film which he put together in 2018. Please consider watching the entire video and we'll put the link up on the chat. We also want to thank Code Pink Women for Peace for sponsoring the, women, the webinar. Um, I, my name is Ann Wright and I'm going to be the moderator of this. I'm a Code Pink member living in Hawaii, but staying in Houston during the COVID uh, pandemic. I'm a retired Army Colonel and a former diplomat, and I resigned from the government in 2003 in opposition to Bush's war on Iraq, and have been challenging U.S. militarism ever since, finally leaving the U.S. government. I'm also a member of Hawaii Peace and Justice and Veterans for Peace in Hawaii. But before we begin our discussion of RIMPAC, uh, since tomorrow is Mother's Day for people in the United States and the mainland and Hawaii, the continental United States. We know that uh, in, in Guahan and in, Korea, in Japan right now, it's already in the morning on Mother's Day and we wish you all happy Mother's Day. And uh, we'd like to ask Jody Evans, the co-founder of uh, uh, Code Pink Women for Peace, the sponsor of our rem um, webinar today, if she would please show us uh, the video made by Code Pink about Mother's Day and why it is it relates so much to what we're talking about trying to stop wars. Thank you, Jody. I tell you no doubt. Let's see, are you able to get the the volume on it, Jody? Jody, you're muted. Here we go. No, it's not coming through. Can you all hear it? You can't hear the sound? Can you turn it up a little more? All the way up. Instead of flowers, give us peace. No, Instead of brunch, end the wars. Let no more mothers raise their children to kill other mothers' children. Give us instead the abolition of war, the promotion of peace, the care of people and planet. Each day, the cruelties of war demand the blunt sacrifices of mothers, children, young and old, civilian and soldier, foreign and domestic. It is time to say no more, to put down our foot, each and every one, and reject military's demand for blood sacrifices in all their many forms. Neither the flesh of our flesh, nor the children of other mothers, nor the prosperity of our labors, nor the earth's vitality should be sacrificed to false idols of war. We, the mothers and the children of mothers, demand respect for common mother, the earth, and for the end of the military's violations of her being. To commemorate Mother's Day without demanding these changes rings flat. For every mother appreciating the beauty of the spring, there is another mother screaming under the terror of bombs and bullets. For every mother savoring breakfast in bed, there is another mother hungry and unhoused stateless and fleeing from war. We, the mothers and the children of mothers, stand united against war and united for the well-being of people and planet. On this Mother's Day 2019, let us promise to protect all children and our imperiled planet. Let no mother's child kill another mother's child. Let every mother stand against war. Let every mother call for peace. Let every mother's cry be heard. This Mother's Day, instead of flowers, give us peace. Instead of brunch, end all wars. Thank you, Jody. Thank you very much. That's a very meaningful um, film today. Um, 
Today, we have four panelists uh, from the Pacific and Asia to discuss the upcoming Rim of the Pacific, Rim Pack, war games or war practices or war maneuvers, all of them preparations for war, which we as citizens want to prevent. Rim Pack is the world's largest international maritime exercise mm -hmm. and is very provocative in regional terms for Asia and the Pacific. The Rim of the Pacific Rim Pack Naval Practice in Hawaiian waters was originally scheduled from June through August of 2020, but due to citizen activism and COVID-19 uh, is now scaled back to the middle to the end of August. Even this shortened war practice is provocative on a regional level, and with the COVID virus, military personnel arriving in Hawaii would endanger citizens of our isolated island state of Hawaii. To give you an idea of the size and scale of these military maneuvers, more than 25,000 military personnel from 25 countries would be in the Hawaiian waters on over 250 ships and aircraft. In 2018, military personnel from 24 other countries, including Australia, Canada, India, Israel, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Singapore, South Korea, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam came to Hawaii. Our four panelists from Guahan, Guam, uh, Hawaii, and Osaka, Japan, will provide more information about the effects of this massive military gathering on their communities. First, we will have Keisha Borja uh, Calvo from Guahan. She is currently an instructor of English and Chamorro Studies at the University of Guam. Keisha is also a PhD candidate in the political science program with specialization in indigenous politics at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. She has worked to curb the military buildup in Guahan. She is a member of the Women's Voices Women Speak and the International Women's Network Against Militarism and the Cancel Rim Pack Coalition. Keisha, would you like to honor us with your words? Just Masi Ann. Um, okay, let me just see if I can share my screen. Okay. Um, half a day from Guahan. Si just Masi, or thank you to the Code Pink organization, uh, to Jody and Anne for coordinating this webinar and the other women activists presenting with me today from Okinawa, Japan, and Hawaii. This webinar is a great opportunity to connect with other activists and to share what is happening on my home island of Guahan, particularly in terms of COVID-19 and the recent situation with the US Navy and one of its aircraft carriers, the USS Theodore Roosevelt. So before discussing the current COVID-19 and USS Theodore Roosevelt situations, I wanted to provide a brief overview of the current militarization of Guahan. Guahan is about 30 miles long and eight miles wide, and about one third of our land is occupied by the US military. Um, their largest installations include an Air Force base and a Naval base. So these lands are located, the occupied lands are located throughout the northern, central, and southern parts of the island. So essentially you can't drive around the island without seeing military fence lines and no trespassing signs. Um, construction for the Marine Corps base has also been ongoing. Um, this is involving the what's now known as the military buildup, the relocation of about 5,000 Marines from Okinawa to Guahan. So the construction has, uh, for the Marine Corps base itself has continued despite an over decade long resistance to the relocation of these Marines from Okinawa to Guahan. So as, it's evident, as is evident, Guahan is a hyper-militarized island. And because of our political status as an unincorporated US territory, um, we do not have much power when it comes to making decisions regarding the military's presence on our island. And this has been especially obvious with the USS Theodore Roosevelt debacle. Um, towards the end of March, it was announced that the USS Roosevelt, which had about 4,800 people on board, needed to dock on Guahan because there were 23 confirmed COVID-19 cases on the ship. Initially, the idea was that the sailors would stay on board the ship. However, immediately after realizing that the cases were increasing, the military worked out a deal with our governor, which allowed more than half of the crew to stay in local hotels outside of the base. Um, and these 
initially these were um, sailors who had tested negative for COVID-19. Um, this was con quite concerning though for many community members outside of the fence as we knew that it would put us directly at risk. Local grassroots organizations such as Ihagan Famalo and Guahan at Samoru Women's Organization wrote to our governor about our concerns and asked her to reconsider her decision. At first, our community knew how many sailors had tested positive, but we were not informed about the contact that may have possibly been made between those who tested negative and those who were infected. Um, so that, that was a big concern for us. We were also worried about the sailors who initially tested negative, but would later retest positive. Um, our skepticisms were eventually actualized. So many sailors who at first tested negative and were moved to these hotels off base later did retest positive. As of May 1st, there were about 1,156 positive cases from the USS Roosevelt. And up until last week, Friday, the Joint Regent Marianas was reporting how many positive cases the USS Roosevelt had. However, they recently revealed that they would no longer be providing that information. So at this point, we, um, the last number that we heard was 1,156, um, but we're still not sure what the, the numbers actually are. Um, and at the start of this week, sailors were being moved from the hotels back to the ship in preparation to leave for training. And those being quarantined will remain on Guahan. And then the ship is planning to return after the training is completed. Of course, our community is still unaware of the details behind the Navy's plans, meaning we still don't know how many sailors actually left the hotels, how many are still in the hotels, um, who's staying on the base, who, who are being quarantined. We're, we're not aware of any of those specifics, which is, which is very problematic for, for our local community. Um, so the USS Roosevelt situation has raised many concerns. And though it seems that outside the fence, our community has been doing fair. We have about 151 cases, uh, five deaths. The impacts of the USS Roosevelt crew and other future military personnel on the health of our community is grave. Um, the situation with the USS Roosevelt is, is concerning in, a, in and of itself. However, we are also worried that it kind of sets the precedence for future carriers or other military personnel um, who, may be in, who may be infected, um, who will be coming to our island or having to stay off base. So in addition to the USS Roosevelt situation, there have been increased naval trainings and these trainings usually occur once every few months. But in the last five weeks alone, the Navy conducted trainings during four, uh, four of those weeks, four weeks out of these past five mm -hmm. weeks. This is with little warning provided to our community. So these trainings are happening much more frequently just in the past month. And they're very dangerous for our community because they occur in civilian lands and uh, uh, residential areas and in civilian waters where our local fishermen are fishing for sustenance. These trainings, again, are happening too frequently and they bring issues with, in terms of the lack of transparency, the contamination of our lands, our waters, our local food source, as well as the safety of our community. So, so tying this all together with RIMPAC, we have to consider what happened with the USS Roosevelt, the outbreak on the ship and the need for sailors to be housed off the ship. This should be very alarming for our brothers and sisters in Hawaii, because even though the military is currently proposing only at sea trainings for its RIMPAC exercises, it is very possible that an outbreak could occur on the sea vessels and that the Hawaii government and local community would be directly impacted. It's also troubling that the military continues to keep information such as the number of positive cases away from the civilian community. And with this kind of track record, who knows what else they're hiding and how it could further devastate our island communities. So to close, I just wanted to say that as we know, our respective issues aren't just our own. We must continue to work together in spaces like these across our lands and our oceans to connect and raise awareness about the impacts of US militarization in our communities. Please ask Maasi. Thank you so much, Keisha. That's, it's, uh very disturbing to hear what uh, has happened to Guahan with the huge numbers of infected uh, military who have descended on the island. And our hearts go out to everyone, to the people of Guahan and of course the, the, the young men and women who have uh, contracted the, the COVID also, yes. 
Uh, next, we'll have Tina uh, Grananetti, who is of Hawaiian heritage, pardon me, of Okinawan heritage, uh, but born and raised on the island of Oahu. <laughs> uh, she is a lecturer in the political science department at the University of Hawaii and a PhD candidate at RMIT University in Australia, formerly known as the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. She is on the board of Hawaii Peace and Justice and a member of the International Women's Network Against Militarism and the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition. Please, Tina. Thank you, aloha everybody. Um, thanks to Code Pink and Anne Wright for organizing this and thank you to everyone for joining us. I see friends in the audience. Um, I, before I start, I just wanted to quickly share a little bit about my genealogy. As um, Anne mentioned, I am gonna be speaking about Hawaii, but I'm not Kanaka Maoli. I'm a settler um, here in occupied Hawaii. Uh, my mother is from Okinawa. Um, she's Uchinanchu, um, the indigenous peoples of Ryukyu or Okinawa. Um, and though we both grew up in really different places, um, we both grew up under or in a place under U.S. occupation, both on islands where nearly a quarter of the land is controlled by the U.S. military. Um, and so I share this not only to like talk about my positionality, but also because my genealogy really speaks to the pervasiveness of US empire in um, Oceania and the Pacific. So um, I think I'll quickly talk about um, RIMPAC 2020 um, and the situation in light of COVID-19, and then talk a little bit more broadly about um, RIMPAC's impacts beyond the pandemic as well. So right now in Hawaii, we're really facing a kind of reckoning with the fact that our two major, the two major drivers of our economy, uh, tourism and the military are predatory and they're making us more vulnerable in crises like this after so many decades of trying to convince us that they were keeping us safe and prosperous. Um, thanks largely to our dependence on tourism, Hawaii's at last count around 30% unemployment. Um, and that's really devastating, but also thanks to that sacrifice of our island community, we have been pretty successful at flattening the, co the curve of COVID-19. So for me, it's a real slap in the face of that sacrifice to see the ways that the US military is putting lives at risk. Um, firstly, like Keisha said, they're refusing to share local data about um, COVID-19 because they say that that disclosure would threaten national security which I really think highlights that the disconnect between national security and genuine security for our communities. Um, and then second, um, there's been, um, we're hearing constant air traffic um, uh, from fighter jets and helicopters and other military aircraft overhead. And it started out anecdotal, but um, Representative Amy Peruso of Wahiwa um, confirms that um, maybe partial, uh, well, the, the official the official um, explanation is that um, the shutdown, sh um, the shutdown shut down certain um, airfields. So certain communities are feeling the burden of these flights um, much more heavily. But even still, every time I hear one of those aircraft roaring overhead, I think about how much each one of those flights costs and how that money could be used um, to help people who are now sitting in up to four hours of traffic just to receive food aid. Um, and then thirdly, they're risking lives by insisting on hosting RIMPAC, um, bringing, a, they just sent out the invitation to 25 countries today. Um, and the real question is how can we be telling people to stay at home, sacrifice paychecks, um, confine themselves to small overcrowded multi-generational homes, um, worry about rent and bills while we're bringing thousands of military personnel from around the world to blow things up. Um, as Anne mentioned, the exercises have been postponed and shortened, so they're now scheduled for August 17th to 31st, um, and they're limited to an at-sea event. Um, and, you know, we could celebrate this as a small victory, but it's just such a low bar um, because the idea that they would ever bring the usual 47 surface ships 
five submarines, 200 aircrafts, and 25,000 troops is just like completely absurd, and it never should have been an option. Um, the justification is that um, it's needed to foster international cooperation and to demonstrate to the world that um, our military is ready to um, keep sea lanes open for commercial shipping and trade. But we know that this reduction is still not enough. And I think obviously at, on this call, at least, most of us can agree that um, hosting war games in the middle of a pandemic is a gross mis misappropriation of resources. We should be actively working to save lives instead of practicing taking them away. Um, but even a limited rim pack will bring logistical support teams on land. And as we've learned from Guahan and from what Keisha just shared with us, um, these ships, like keeping sailors at sea isn't necessarily safer. Ships have been shown to be incubators of, of the virus. The military has elevated rates of COVID-19 and 40 US ships have had confirmed cases of um, coronavirus with I think 26 having active cases. And again, the Navy doesn't disclose which of these ships are um, or have active outbreaks. So if an outbreak were to occur at sea during RIMPAC, then RIMPAC would absolutely not be an at sea only event anymore because those sailors would have to disembark to be quarantined and to seek medical care. And the people of Hawaii would be the ones to bear the burden of quarantining those sailors and personnel. So what we're trying to do is in Hawaii, we've formed the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition, which is a broad coalition of activists, environmentalists, Kia'i or protectors of Aina land um, to demand that RIMPAC is not only postponed but cancelled. And right now we're tactically just focusing on RIMPAC 2020 and um, the pandemic, which has already been an interesting process because we see how undemocratic this decision is that none of our elective officials actually have any authority to call the games off, um, but we can at least demand that they try, right? Um, and then beyond that, we're thinking much more deeply about militarism across Mona Nui, Oceania, and we have an international committee so far with members from Guahan, Kisha, um, South Korea, Okinawa, and Hawaii, um, formed not only for political power, but also so that we can be in touch with each other to avoid um, having our communities pitted against each other like we've seen between Okinawa and um, Guam. And then we're also working from the basic idea that RIMPAC should be canceled after 2020 as well. Um, I'm wondering how much time I have, but um, so we need to think about canceling RIMPAC beyond this year because every year for the, or every two years, RIMPAC has come to destroy our island resources. Um, live fire maritime exercises, the sink X, exercises where they um, shoot at decommissioned ships until they sink them to the bottom of the ocean, just like 55 kilom kilometers offshore. Um, they've been shown to release um, chemicals and car carcinogenic materials into the waters. Um, in 2018, um, exercises at Pohokuloa set 2,000 acres of land on fire, and that's at the base of Mauna Kea, um, the Pico of Hawaiian Cosmologies, and the center of the Kukia Imauna movement. Um, and then after all that destruction, we're told that we should be grateful for this $50 million boost to our economy. But this doesn't take into account the real costs of militarism in Hawaii. We have corroding fuel tanks at Red Hill threatening our aquifers. Um, military allowances driving up the cost of housing, um, destruction of cultural sites, unexploded ordinances. They just had to um, detonate a few off of the coast of Kailua um, a couple of weeks ago. And of course, the suppression of Hawaiian sovereignty and self-determination. Um, one of our coalition members, Billy Kinney, he's Kanaka and a member of the Kia'i Kanaloa Network. He did this really beautiful video talk story about the impacts of um, RIMPAC on the Kanaloa realm. And Kanaloa is a, a kua or god associated with the ocean and whose kinolau or like different manifestations are, they include cetacean species like whales and dolphins. And the Kia'i Kanaloa network has 
um, been working to protect and care for those species through cultural practice, but of course, under occupation, that becomes a political act. So they've had to um, engage in the struggle against RIMPAC because of the harm that it does um, to Kanaloa through, especially through the barrage of sonar activity. Um, the US Navy's own EIS said that um, in previous years, RIMPAC has exposed 250,000 marine mammals to hearing loss from sonar, which risks their survival. Um, and Billy called this ecocide, and he said, what is done to Kanaloa in the ocean is done to Kanaka on land, which um, really stuck with me um, because we can see how this disregard for indigenous lands and waters is basically one in the same with its disregard for indigenous lives and bodies and the lives and bodies of other victims of imperialism. Um, and then one last thing I wanted to touch on is the way that RIMPAC also um, can be understood through this idea of militarism, which is a term coined by um, Teresia Teayua, who um, talks about the ways that these two industries disguise one another and enable one another. And at RIMPAC, um, during most years, <laughs> maybe not this year, um, they, troops are given up to 12 Liberty Days, which means they can take those days to participate in tours around the island, go snorkeling, learn to surf. Um, and you think about that, these men coming to blow up the ancestral sacred lands of Kanaka Maoli, um, and at the same time consume the beauty of those lands as though they're on vacation. And then this is, of course, is tied into the spike in sex trafficking and gendered violence that we see during RIMPAC. Those same men coming to a feminized and exoticized island nation and expecting to be welcomed by women and feeling entitled to their bodies. Um, it's militarism, it's imperialism, it's heteropatriarchy all rolled up in one and it needs to stop, but it won't stop until we organize to stop it. And um, as one kind of final bit of bad news, the Indo-Pacific Command just submitted a report to Congress calling for $20 billion of additional funding over the next five years to um, uh, detain, or sorry, for China deterrence, essentially. Um, they cited um, COVID-19 and increased instability in the region as more justification for further militarization. Um, and, you know, this is to secure the economic and political dominance of the U.S., but it does nothing to support the well-being of the people of the United States or the people of Hawaii, or in this case, even the troops and sailors who are also living through a pandemic. Um, so I guess we're like so disturbed by these attempts to appropriate the language of cooperation for these war games, but also a little bit hopeful because we're also hearing kind of unprecedented calls to uh, for a global ceasefire and for a global reduction in military spending. So maybe there's hope that in this moment we can kind of push forward different visions for our future in the Pacific, in Oceania. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tina, very much. And just to add something to what you had said, um, the whole issue of uh, sexual exploitation during these military exercises uh, the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women uh, has an anti-trafficking campaign that's been going on for a long period of time. And some of the statistics that they have, or some of the data, uh, comes from actually the Arizona State University that, that has done a lot of research on this and says that Hawaii is one of the worst demand problems in America. And a large number of, of buyers of sex are from the military bases. And when you do have this influx of 25,000 coming from all over the world, uh, even though we will not have that many on land this time, we hope, um, the, the scale back that the military talks about of just having command and control units and logistics units um, mean that a low estimate of the number of of military that will be coming ashore will be at least 250 and probably more, of 450 and probably more. So that, that potential is there, um, as, as you have noted. 
we'll go on to our next uh, uh, oh, panelist. Anna. Um, Lise is, is on. I can allow her to talk. She doesn't seem to be able to get on the participant, but I could, I could <laughs> unmute her if you want her just to talk. So I'm going to unmute her and you can introduce her. Yes, that would be great. And uh, Hisai, we're glad you're here, <laughs> uh, even though we can't see you right now. But uh, uh, we are so thrilled to have with us two members of Code Pink from Japan. Code Pink Japan has been an, uh, an organization, gosh, for over 10 years, and they've been so kind to ask uh, several of us to come to uh, mainland Japan and have assisted us in traveling throughout uh, the mainland of Japan and have taken groups on down to Okinawa. We've been to Guahan. Uh, so our Code Pink uh, sisters in, in Japan have been very, very active. Hisai Ogawa is uh, the organizer for Code Pink uh, Women for Peace in Japan. She has a long history of opposing Japanese militarism uh, and US bases in Japan and Okinawa and nuclear weapons. She has led Code Pink uh, Japan delegations to Washington DC, to New York City and to San Francisco among other places. So he said, oh, now we can see you, yay. Can Good. you hear me? Well, we, yeah. we can see <laughs> you okay? when we hear you. So please go ahead. Uh, can 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 you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, good, good. Sorry, sorry. Um, um, now can I start? Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so Anne and Jody and everyone, thank you very much for letting me in. I had some technical problem and I was so late. I'm sorry. Then, um, then I'll just start. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um. So let me start with a brief introduction of uh, Code Pink Osaka. Mo Anne already um, told, told it about it, but, but just add something about what uh, we are doing. So uh, uh, Code Pink Osaka started um, when we visited the Code Pink House in DC back in 2007. And since then, uh, we've been very active uh, organizing peace actions together with and and Medea and Jody, thank you. Um, and the global actions, we are very grateful for your support. And so domestically in, in Japan, and since we are living in Osaka, uh, we are working at Western part of Japan mainly, uh, some peace actions, and also uh, uh, national issues of, of no no war and and issues and against our uh, Abe administration because he's a big liar and a big, um, he doesn't respect uh, the right of our constitution, a peaceful constitution. So, um, and then um, my personal career as a peace activist started back in 1960s when I was a university student. The civil rights movement was on the upswing in the United States and the Vietnam War started in Asia. As a student of American studies, I got interested in the civil rights movement in the United States. And when United States started attacking Vietnam, I was in the student protest movement. My college campus was very close to US military bases in Tokyo namely Yokota Air Base and Tachikawa Base. And jet bombers flew over our campus with roaring noise toward North Vietnam. I couldn't let it go and got involved in no war actions. Later, I studied in the United States College for master's degree. I tried the comparative study between the US occupation of Japan after the World War II and the Yankees, what you call Yankees occupation of the South after the Civil War. It's a very interesting comparison. And then um, in 1970s, I'd been in the international women's movement in support of United Nations International Women's Year Initiative. So uh, I respect the women's leadership and initiatives in the peace and justice movement women play the vital role in the movement. I'd like to be a part of it wherever I am. And then the 
my 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 point of argument on this today's uh, pan panel, uh, RIMPAC, Council RIMPAC, the reason why the Japanese people are against sending SDF forces, self-defense forces of Japan to, to RIMPAC, we are, because we are against it because in, our, in my view and in our view, SDF's operations overseas, such as joining RIMPAC, are against the constitution of Japan. And in Article 9 of our constitution, we renounce war and any uh, war-related actions. So RIMPAC is really joining. RIMPAC itself is against our constitution, but sending SDF, our SDF forces is really the violation of Article 9. That's my interpretation. So, uh, since Japanese people have the sovereign right to decide our policy, our government, we have to watch very carefully about the operation of SDF. And if they operate against our constitution, we have to say no when the S that's my, our obligation, our Japanese people's obligation. So, and then in terms of uh, COVID-19, SDF forces, SDF's work, main work should be confined in the domestic field. And the SDF role is help people at the time of natural disasters, such as earthquakes, typhoons, tsunamis, and bank caused pandemics such as COVID-19. So now that COVID-19 pandemic is attacking us Japanese people, as well. SDF should stay in Japan and help us by all means. They have no time to go overseas to join the military exercise. We are against the SDF being sent to the Middle East or any other conflict in war-stricken areas. That's not their role. So uh, we say, with all your viewers, sisters, Cancel RIMPAC, Medicare, not warfare in solidarity. Thank you. Let's see. We totally agree with you. Uh, cancel RIMPAC and Medicare, healthcare, and not warfare, for sure. That's one of Code Pink's mottos. That's right. Yeah. We have with us also from Osaka, Japan, Akiko Aguchi, who is an active member of Code Pink working for in local, local issues in Osaka and also in Okinawa and elsewhere in Japan. She's active in global issues as well, joining in the Code Pink actions in the U.S. and yes. in New York, San Francisco. And she's mm -hmm. the one that drafted the letter uh, to the Japanese Ministry of Defense, uh, yeah. arguing that uh, the, the country of Japan should not participate in RIMPAC. And Akiko, we are so glad that you're with us. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, and everyone. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not a good English speaker. So I wonder, uh, I can tell you uh, my feeling perfectly, but I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my, my mother told me, told me this story when I was a small child. She was a young mother living in Isahaya, a neighboring town of Nagasaki. On August 9, U.S. dropped an A-bomb on Nagasaki. Next day, on August 10, she ventured into Nagasaki City in search of her sister who was a nurse working in a hospital in Nagasaki. My mother told me horrible horrific story of Nagasaki bombing. She witnessed to nobody but me. She passed away without saying anything more. Mm. So I feel uh, very fair of, about uh, a bomb. Uh, in 1910, I participated in a 
parade in New York to appeal bombing nuclear weapon. I met Sai there and started supporting Code Pink. Uh, on this year, on January uh, 25, Anne and Code Pink invited us to join the International Peace Action. We, as Code Pink Osaka, organized our peace action in Osaka city in solidarity with sisters in the US and in the world over. I contributed an article on this action to Asahi Shimbun Daily Journal and it appeared on the reader's column. I sent request mail to the friends all over Japan, Hokkaido, Shizuoka, Kyoto, etc. They tried their own actions. And upon the request of joining the Cancer Rimmerback campaign, I drafted the protest letter to the defense military to withdraw from Rimpac and send it from Code Pink Osaka, like this letter. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There it is. <laughs> uh, Abe administration keeps ignoring the lives of the Japanese people. We will continue to demand the measures of the government for everyone living in Japan to survive. Uh, yesterday, uh, young people stand, uh, stand in Osaka city and I supported them. So uh, I stand with them and <laughs> I think Abe is over and <laughs> Abe no mask. <laughs> I tried two songs. <laughs> it's very mm, fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Akiko. And let me yeah. tell you, when I first met Akiko, she spoke very, 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 very little English. And she's been taking English lessons and you, you're <laughs> speaking very, very well. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, but Hisai and Akiko yes. and all of the uh, Code Pinkers in uh, Osaka, Japan, and other parts of Japan, uh, what they do is, is so important in international solidarity. And we appreciate you all so much and carrying the, the flag uh, of the pink Code Pink. Uh, we really do appreciate it, and we're looking forward for your next trip to the U.S. I, I know you were planning on coming to New York City uh, in March for the nonproliferation uh, conference, but with that canceled. So we look forward to you returning to the U.S. at, at some stage. Now we have about eight minutes left, and uh, I haven't really seen any questions in our chat. Um, so if anybody has some, please go ahead and, and put some questions in. Uh, but uh, I, I have a couple of little questions, not little questions, but uh, 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 other questions. Uh, Tina, you, you went through a list of uh, military uh, exercises or military bases uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, I know that there are there are a lot of problems with them. Could you mention to the audience uh, more about what Red Hill is and uh, some of those types of environmental things we're working on? Sure. Um, I haven't been super active in the um, Red Hill issue, but um, basically there are massive fuel tanks um, underground um, sitting on top of Oahu's freshwater aquifer. Um, I think they were um, built in like world during the World War II era um, and haven't been properly maintained. Um, and now they've corroded so that um, in some places, um, they're only about as thick a, um, as the width of a dime. 
Um, and right now there is a battle going on to try to get the military to um, replace them um, or move them entirely. Um, and I think they're kind of insisting that that's not really necessary. Um, the thing is that part of the wall is right up against like rock face, so you can't um, easily access it. Um, and that's one of the major issues um, that we're facing here on Oahu right now. Yes, it, and it is a major one. It's, these were built during World War II to store all the, the fuel that was needed for all of the fleets that were going out for the war. They are 20 stories tall or 20 stories deep. 20 of them that are 20 stories deep, holding all of this jet fuel 100 feet above the water aquifer of Hawaii or of Oahu. So it's really, really a very dangerous place, dangerous place. We do have two questions and they center around environmental issues. One is a general one of the, the what is the environmental impact of uh, rim pack exercises? And then a specific one on does the military have to get permission to uh, uh, kill marine animals, essentially, in, in their uh, war games? Keisha, would you like to address some of this? Um, sure. So for um, the environmental impact of the RIMPAC, so yeah, live fire training is, is done during these, during the RIMPAC trainings. Um, both on usually in the ocean as well as as well as on land but now that they're proposing to um now that the navy's proposing to just have the exercises in the ocean then um live fire training will be conducted there um as far as the you know requesting for permission or having to access permission to conduct these exercises um Typically, there's an environmental impact statement that's usually uh, the process that usually has to be completed uh, before major, any other major military construction or other projects, like, like the construction of a base, for example. Um, however, with RIMPAC, it, this, this is one of those like exceptions um, where they can um, engage in these kinds of exercises without getting the permission of the community or, or anybody or um, any kind of environmental agencies, they, they, they're able to kind of um, engage with these exercises, which is very concerning because as, as in that video we saw earlier when where Anne was talking about um, how they um, basically bomb a ship and let it sink to the sea, you know, the kinds of environmental impacts that those have on, um, on the waters and on the contamination of the water, but also on the marine, um, marine life in, in those ocean waters. Um, they're very, concerning um but it's also you know the exception right so this is the exception to their own kinds of environmental policies um and that's very problematic for this situation thank you uh two other questions we have one is does anyone know the cost of rimpac and the second one is what is the call to action for us um uh, uh, does anyone know <laughs> what the cost is? It's, uh, I would just say it's way too much. Uh, uh, you can probably get the, some figures from each of the national um, militaries, but I've never seen a document that has it all added up to what really it is costing the world's environment um, uh, by this. Um, then on what, are, what is our call to action? Well. We do have a, a petition, uh, you know, there's always a petition for everything. And uh, we, all, we have over 11,000 signatures on our petition to cancel RIMPAC. And if you haven't uh, uh, been able to sign it yet, if you go to Roots Action, Roots Action and cancel RIMPAC, uh, you can sign up there. Uh, uh, Tina, could you tell us what's going on in Honolulu or in, in Hawaii about trying to work with the political leaders to try to get this canceled? Sure. Um, quickly on the question of cost, you know, we're always told that Hawaii gains $50 million from these exercises, um, which it's only one way of measuring cost and value. Um, like Keisha said, um, 
it, I mean, it can't measure the damage that it does to our oceans and the wealth that could come, the different kinds of wealth and abundance that could come from our oceans if we really valued and respected them. Um, so earth justice, sorry, I'm kind of backtracking to the question about the um, marine mammals as well, but earth justice in 2013 sued um, saying it was challenging fishery services decision to allow um, these trainings. And I think that they um, eventually settled so that, and this, this was based on the Navy's own reporting of how many mammals were killed. Um, and they settled and the Navy said it would try to reduce um, its use of sonar um, and reduce its impact on these mammals, but it still continues um, to impact them. Um, and then in terms of um, actions, um, I think there are probably a lot of activists on this call. Um, and so it would be great if you could get in touch. Um, we're thinking one strategy that we've come up with as the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition is um, for folks from pr participating nations to lobby their governments, just as um, Hisai and Akiko have. Um, and even like RIMPAC in previous years has also involved training in Southern California. So um, if there are folks on the call from California, there are probably ways that you can help us by um, lobbying your elected officials or military officials where you live. Um, the petition's great, but also we can get in touch directly and try to maybe come up with other strategies as well. Absolutely, and the, uh, as we speak of other countries trying to get their, their uh, national government to cancel them, as uh, uh, our Code Pink sisters in, in Japan have tried, also in New Zealand, there have been a, there's been a very strong letter to the Minister of, of Defense uh, from a large number of organizations asking that uh, New Zealand pull it, their, their uh, military out of it. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Hisai and Akiko a question. Uh, you all are usually attend the August 6th and August 9th uh, ceremonies in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, are those ceremonies going to be held in person this year or will they be virtual issue, uh, uh, in virtual uh, webinars uh, uh, because of the COVID-19? If you could unmute yourself, Hisai. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Um, yeah. Probably they have uh, online conference instead of, yeah. But they are still discuss, discussing, I think. But, uh -huh. uh, but probably it's not possible to organize such a class conference in Hiroshima this yeah. year. Mm. Well, yeah. And uh, and I am, can you just give me one one few minutes sure. to add more? Um, you know, um, of course we are against the, the SDF operations, but also, you know, we saw uh, so mad at uh, our Abe administration is spending so much um, spending for military and, and entertain American bases and American military. So, so even in this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, he, uh, Abe doesn't make any cut in our national budget and, and spend more buying uh, such an expensive uh, military uh, um, goods from military uh, spending and they, he buys, um, for instance, um, what was what, what that? Um, Where'd you go? Bring your face back in. Uh, air, air, aircraft, <laughs> uh, yeah, aircraft, <laughs> so many things. So we have to really push our government, spend money to, to Medicare, not military. That's really our point. And so, and I just uh, got uh, some information from how the, the Korean government, they may, uh, 
uh, Korean now Korea have the Republic of Korea. I mean, uh, they they cut the spending of military. So so our uh, Japanese government is really the worst government, you know, uh, in now in this uh, to to attack the pandem pandemic you now the COVID nineteen situation. That's what I wanted to add. One point. Thank well, you. Thank you very very much. We appreciate that and. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, military spending in virtually any country except perhaps South Korea is going down. The U.S. military, as Tina has mentioned, is asking for even more money. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that the uh, program for development of uh, nuclear weapons for the United States continues mm -hmm. on uh, unabated. Mm -hmm. We are now at the end of our one hour. and. We want to thank all of you all uh, for being with us, our panelists uh, from uh, all over the Pacific and from Asia. Uh, we want to thank Code Pink Women for Peace and Jody Evans, the co-founder, for being our thank host you. And, and our technical advisor on this. Uh, uh, the, the Cancel or Impact Coalition is having a series of webinars uh, with various groups uh, representing different uh, perspectives on this. And we will certainly let Code Pink know so that they can advertise through their very extensive uh, network. And we thank everyone and uh, stay safe, stay safe and cancel RIMPAC. <laughs> thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, take care. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> bye bye.